thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for inviting um, Product Step. And thank you to all of you for sharing your time tonight to learn a little bit about us. Um, before jumping in and before uh, saying a little bit about myself and, um, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And before jumping in, um, we want to start with this video uh, that has a short performance from this past gen January. Project Step envisions a world in which the classical music profession reflects the racial and ethnic diversity of our communities. Performing tonight is the Project Step Honors Quartet. Thank you, everyone. Um, we felt what better way to start than, you know, showcasing our students. Um, uh, Product Step is, is uh, that's what's at the center of our work. So we wanted to kick off with that. My name is Javier Caballero. I'm the artistic director, and we're very happy to be here. That was um, for those of you who are curious about the piece. That was the Honors Quartet uh, performing uh, the Danzas de Panama by William Grant Still. That was the third movement. Um, and that was at the State of the City address in Boston this past January uh, with uh, Mayor uh, Marty Walsh. So that was a very huge honor uh, for our students to perform. Um, I Tonight, you're gonna hear a little, a little bit uh, uh, from different angles about um, our small but mighty nonprofit. Um, and we definitely wanna hear from you. I'm sure you guys have questions and um, we're definitely sharing um, just one of many ways, you know, that uh, we are making a difference in our community. There's so many amazing programs and we're very honored to be in this series um, to share how we are going about making a difference in our community. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm the artistic director um, and that means in this role, um, I oversee all the artistic activities the curriculum, the performances, the partnerships, uh, the student evaluations and auditions. Um, I interact quite a bit with all the students, the faculty. Um, obviously we have a, a small uh, staff. We work very closely together. Um, 
And I also wanted to share a little bit about how I ended up in um, arts administration. Um, I'm a cellist by training. Um, I got my bachelor's in cello performance at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, I, I see uh, I have a, there's somebody, Michelle, who's also connected with USF in Tampa. I did uh, my bachelor's in, in cello performance and music education. That's my background, those were my, those are uh, two of my passions. And then I came to Boston to do my master's in cello performance at the Boston Conservatory. And while I was finishing my, actually I, I had already finished my master's and I was working at post-grad at the Boston Conservatory in performance. Uh, a friend of mine who was a senior at the time at Predic Step uh, asked me if I would do them a favor of volunteering to play for their 25th anniversary gala um, at Symphony Hall. They needed one more cellist to do the Via Lobos Bacchianas, uh, which is an, an amazing piece for eight cellos. And I volunteered, I said, yeah, no problem, I'll help you guys out. And through that, that was my entry into arts administration. I was not planning it. I was not expecting it. I, I would say it's very non-traditional in some ways. And in some other ways, maybe it's very traditional that um, I, I, uh, um, I'm sure you guys have heard from other arts administrators that some of us knew that path. Some of us did not. Some of us kind of came indirectly and I was one of those indirect. Um, so I performed at that, the 25th anniversary gala for Product Step. I, I knew of the program, but that I met the artistic director at the time, William Thomas, and he was so grateful. He said, Javier, you know, thank you for volunteering. I could give you part-time work being our instrument manager, five hours a week, are you interested? And at that point, you know, I was doing my postgrad. I was freelancing a little bit. I was teaching a little bit and, you know, trying to get my, you know, uh, work off the ground. And I said, yeah, I would love, I would love to do that. And that was my end. I became the instrument manager for a year. And then a year later, uh, you know, I got to know all the families. They said, Javier, would you be interested in being the program coordinator at that time? And I'm like, oh, you know, I, sure. I don't know much about administration, but I, I love this program. I, I love interacting with the families. And um, that's kind of how one thing led to another. Six years later, after I became the instrument manager, I, through a series of uh, promotions, I ended up becoming the artistic director of Predict Step um, back then. And I was the artistic director for three years. And then my path took me to another organization. I spent three years after that uh, from the top, the NPR radio show. And then I find myself uh, through many on, you know, we never know where our paths take, take us. Here I am uh, as of August, this past summer, I am happy and honored to be back, to be being the artistic director of Product Step. So that is my path of how I ended up in arts administration. I did not get a degree in it. I, I do tell a lot of people that I, I learned on the job. Uh, one of the benefits of being in a small nonprofit, you wear many hats. So I had to learn about marketing and development in addition to artistic planning and, uh, you know, being a, a counselor to parents to students, um, how to communicate, how to be organized. So that there was a lot of on the job training and I'm very thankful for that. Um, it was very formative. Um, and what, it's, what it excites me about this work, I was introduced to it, turns out that I was good at it, but also it ended up becoming my third passion. I mentioned earlier that early on, I, I knew that I wanted to perform and teach. Those were my two passions, they still are. And then arts administration, became a third passion of mine. So I, I, I feel, um, I consider myself very lucky to have this trifecta of performing, teaching and arts administration work uh, that I'm still somewhat managing to do during this pandemic. I'm still active with my teaching and performing um, to a certain degree, um, but I'm also very lucky that I, I have this multifaceted career as an artist in Boston. So that's lesson number one that I can share with you guys is, is you know, that diversify your interest and your talents and whatever you, if, if you have an interest um, in it, don't just be one track minded uh, in the arts that used to be the reality. And I think, uh, I, I don't know when, but definitely the last 10 years or more, that reality has changed, you know, where for many of us in the arts, we just have these multifaceted careers 
that that's just one of the, the first of many lessons that I've learned in on my path as an arts administrator. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the core curriculum of the program before I pass it along um, to um, my colleagues. Um, so some of the characteristics that make Project Step unique, you heard about what the vision of our program is, what the mission is um, to address the underrepresentation we of certain racial and ethnic minorities, primarily Black and Latinos in the classical music world. Um, we're not the only ones addressing this issue, but we are certainly unique in many ways, including we've been doing it for nearly 40 years. But some of the other characteristics that make our program very unique is we provide comprehensive uh, instruction. That means we don't just give an instrument and private lessons. We also provide orchestra, chamber music, theory, solfege, master classes, workshops, essentially the whole uh, musical diet, if you will, that's necessary for a high level music education. We also provide long-term instruction. Uh, we have a feeder program that starts in kindergarten, identifying students uh, that have uh, talent studying in kindergarten. And most of our students enter the program through that. And they're with us for 12 plus years, you know, a half a year in kindergarten and then grades one through 12. Um, so long-term to, to really have a shot at, you know, uh, having a career in classical music, you have to start early. Um, so that's one of the things that we identified is important. Quality instruction. Uh, we provide a performance opportunities with the Boston Pops occasionally. You know, we focus on, on providing classes with the, the best faculty in Boston. Um, some member faculty members are from the Boston Symphony. We have partnerships with groups like A Far Cry. Um, so we just really focus on quality instruction. Um, that's one of our uh, the things that we're privileged that we're able to provide to our students. And finally, finally a, a very wide community of support. We don't just provide the instruction, but we, we really are very small and nimble where we have a connection with the families. Um, so that is a, a little bit about myself, my role, a little bit about what makes Product Step unique. I do, before I pass it along to my colleague, I want to share just a three minute video to kind of show the students the instruction in action. You know, I, I mentioned um, quality, um, I mentioned um, long-term. So I, I kind of want to, we have this short video that kind of gives you a glimpse of that. Um, so if you give me one second, let me pull it up. So this is what instruction and performance opportunities look like at Product Step. One more thing. Do, re, Thank you. 
So it was a family concert in Franklin Park. And when the day came, I was nervous, but I think we had a dress rehearsal the day before in Symphony Hall. So I kind of got my nerves out there, thankfully. And then when the day came, I was still nervous, but I was able to kind of enjoy it more. And I'm just really grateful to even be able to have that kind of experience. So we started with the third movement of William Grant Still and we ended, that was the, the fourth and last movement of the William Grant Still. And with that, I will pass it along to my colleague, one of your very own, Rachel Forbes. Thank you, Javier. Hi, everyone. It is so nice um, to be welcomed back to the UMass community and it's nice to see some familiar faces and names. So thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Rachel Forbes, and I am the Program and Communications Manager at Project STEP, and I've had the pleasure of holding this position for a little over a year now. So I graduated last um, May, May of 2019. At Project STEP, I am responsible for creating and implementing enrichment programming for our students, which includes workshops and seminars, free concert opportunities, community performances, and volunteer opportunities. To give the enrichment workshop some context, um, this fall we have two workshops on the books for our families. The first was a college admission seminar, which actually took place um, this time last week, where our families were able to um, attend a presentation from a college consulting firm and had the chance to ask questions about the admissions process with a professional college advisor. Another quick example of um, what is an enrichment workshop, I've been working now with a local psychologist who's also a violinist to put together a workshop on practicing mindfulness. So this is something that our high school students will take part in later this coming November. Um, with enrichment programming in general, I try to focus on fostering the whole child. So meaning physically, mentally, emotionally, and of course, as it relates to being a musician of color. We also know that gathering together outside of um, what are usually really packed and crazy Saturdays, um, gathering outside of our regular programming helps us to continue to build that small community uh, like feel that Javier was talking about. So sort of shifting over to the community service and engagement piece of my role, um, community service has always been a fundamental part of the project step curriculum. And the motivation for this effort is to have students share their talents and give something back to the communities that have nurtured them for so long. So we, every year we encourage students to make their own arrangements for these community performances. Um, in a normal year, you know, there are plenty of performance opportunities that come up. Um, just a few examples, last year, we had a couple of groups go to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute during the holidays. Um, and this year we're hoping to get creative and schedule some virtual performances. Um, beyond giving back to the community, this is also an opportunity for all of our students to perform. So particularly for our younger students who might not get as many performance opportunities, this gives them a chance to be heard um, in front of a wider audience. In addition to this, I um, have worked over the past year to create and now manage our official peer mentoring program, which is open and offered to all students in grades one through 12. So the goal of this program is to create ongoing relationships between our mentors and mentees and to across the board sort of strengthen and foster relationships. Um, given the wide age, age range of our students, you can imagine that Every 12th grader might not know every first grader um, since they have such different schedules. 
So we have about half of our students participating in this program this year, um, and they meet on a weekly basis. Our older student mentors offer practice help to these younger students. Um, some of them are tutoring them in theory, offering advice, and most importantly, friendship. So um, beyond building connections between all of our students, this also gives our older students some really valuable teaching experience. Uh, moving on to communication side of things, outside of enrichment programming, I manage our social media accounts and I create our monthly newsletter, which keeps our partners and friends in the know. Um, and I also do some internal communications with our families and just do my best to make sure that their voice is heard and that they feel supported by us. So that is, gives you a really um, broad sense of <laughs> everything that I do with Project STEP. And then I just wanted to touch on how and why I got into this field fairly recently. Um, I'll start by saying that music has always called to me, obviously so much so that I decided to study music education at UMass with plans to become a classroom music teacher. Um, I'll offer full transparency in saying that about a year or two into the music ed program, I was feeling inside that I was pretty sure that I did not want to be a school music teacher. Um, and I'll also say that this for me was a really difficult realization. You know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the music ed program at UMass and it's rigorous and incredible. And all of my, or many of my peers were so excited to become these music educators and all of my professors were so excited. And I just had this feeling like it wasn't for me. So um, throughout my junior year, I started researching summer music internship opportunities, mostly with opera companies and festivals, because that's what I knew. I'm a vocalist, so I studied voice at UMass. Um, but ultimately, I landed a position with the Boston Symphony Orchestra out at Tanglewood for the summer. To say that this experience changed my life would be a major understatement. Um, Javier was talking about how he sort of landed into arts admin. I actively <laughs> searched it out, but I still didn't really know what it meant. Um, so working for the BSO for the summer, I was exposed to this whole new world of arts administration and I was able to see firsthand the inner workings of a major orchestra. And I, I was also through this position able to just dip my toes into a lot of different areas um, and see all of these different career paths. So I ended up returning to Tanglewood last summer in a similar position and um, started my work with Project STEP just a couple of days after the festival ended. So it's uh, the rest is history. <laughs> um, I also just want to add on what excites me about the work I do. Um, I'm so incredibly proud to work for an organization that has been working towards racial equality in the arts for almost 40 years. And especially now where this is, um, a hot topic in today's climate. It's really incredible to me that this organization has been doing this work for so long. And even though I decided that I didn't want to be a, a classroom music teacher, I do feel really strongly that everyone deserves access to a high quality music education. So truly every day I'm excited by the opportunity to play my part in this really impactful work. Um, and being able to watch our students progress um, while they're with us, you know, when they first come in in first grade, even from year to year, is so rewarding to me. And that's what I found rewarding about teaching. So I'm able to get all of the things that I love into one role. Um, and then I'll just add, you know, knowing that they will find, or all of our students will find success in whatever they choose to do, whether it's music or not. Um, knowing that they will be successful is extremely fulfilling to me. So with that, we wanted to share a video with you of one of our students, Miguel. Um, this is part of our Meet the Musician series where we interview students. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. My name is Miguel, I'm seven years old and I play violin. I started when I was four years old and I started playing violin too that had a beautiful sound.
I have two. Their name is Beethoven and Mozart, and I like them because they write for a lot of orchestras. I get to play with my friend violin, and I get to have private lessons with the best teacher in the world called Miss Liana. <laughs> is that you have to do perfect, you have to do the bow hold, you have to do the fingers right. Stop playing with video games and start listening to it because it is so, it's so beautiful. Well, thank, thank you guys so much. She's so sweet. Um, with that, I will pass the mic off to my colleague, Jody. Hi, everyone. I'm like tearing up after I'm <laughs> watching that. I love Miguel. Um, so my name is Jody McMenamin, and I am the manager of donor engagement at Project Step. I have been with the program since 2014, um, and I've been in development and fundraising, um, specifically in the cultural sec sector for about uh, 15 years. Um, I came into this role from a place of creativity. I'm a trained fine arts painter and printmaker, um, and before that, uh, industrial designer. Um, and then I received my master's actually in arts administration uh, at Boston University. Um, so I sort of am able to take these two parts uh, of the creative sector, both as an artist and as an administrator, as Javier was mentioning earlier, many people that are in these roles often are still in the arts. Unlike my colleagues who are all musically um, gifted, <laughs> I, I'm just a painter. I you know, may, might pick up the triangle at some point. Um, but this, this position has been very rewarding for me. Um, I'm able, I work part-time, I work 25 hours a week and I'm also able to paint. Um, and STEP has really become part of my family. Um, it's very near and dear to me. And I think everyone that works within our program eventually says that uh, it really becomes a community and, and the families become your family. Um, so regarding my work in fundraising, um, I primarily work with staff and the board to make sure that our current and future fiscal vitality of, um, and health of the organization is able to support our students and our programming. And I do this specifically through um, donations and contributions from individuals in our community. Um, as opposed to grant writing, we have a separate grant writer that does that. So as you can imagine, we with 58 students in the program, um, we not only need to make sure that we can support them today, but well into the future, as um, Javier mentioned, this is a long-term program and a very rigorous program. So every year that we take on more students, we have to make sure that we're going to be supporting them for all of their young career. Um, we quite literally are investing in their future and the future of our uh, community as a collective. 100% um, of our students that have graduated through Project STEP go on to a uh, college or conservatory and approximately 60% go into the music profession. Um, and these are statistics that I often tell a lot of our donors because it's, it's very impressive. Um, and even if they're not going into the music profession, we're supporting them in whatever career that they would like to choose. Um, we are only able to do this because of our individual support. Um, a large portion of our budget uh, is made up of that individual support, approximately 45% of our annual budget, um, I'm gonna say roughly, don't you know, quote me on <laughs> these, but roughly, uh, is raised through individual donations. Um, between 28 and 30% is raised 
in foundations um, and then we have investments in kind and then a small percentage, I think it's only about three or 4% is actually performance fees or program fees, although many of our students are subsidized through a uh, scholarship. So um, those don't, who don't have um, those, so most, not most, but I would say a, a fair amount um, don't pay anything at all. And those who do end up paying only pay about $350 a year. Um, so it's really important um, as a fundraiser when I'm looking at all of this and knowing that when I'm talking to donors and when I'm going to individuals that we, I really am asking for them to invest in our students' future. Um, so how is this money raised from individuals um, other than direct asks uh, over the phone or online or we're not in person anymore, but uh, what used to be in person, we have an annual fund that goes out in the fall. And uh, this also uh, corresponds with an e-appeal. Um, and we also have cultivation and stewardship events, um, which again are now online. Our next event is actually coming up in December. It, it's gonna be on Giving Tuesday, which if you don't know what Giving Tuesday is, it's a global day of giving back. Um, so Tuesday, December 1st, we're having an event and we'll do that online similar to uh, this, this sort of format. Uh, it'll be a way for us to ask our current donors and board to bring new people into our program. So we're still, um, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic, still working, working in ways around fundraising so that we're able to still uh, be visible with our constituents. Um, so another way that we sort of are fundraising with people is really word of mouth. Our friends and our supporters of the program are fully engaged in our mission and our work and become advocates of our program. And we're very lucky for that because they really are the ones that help spread um, the important work that we're doing. Um, I would say that one example of this is that in 2014, uh, Project Step won a National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award under the Obama administration. This was the highest award given for an out-of-school program uh, that you can get in the nation. And we, uh, we went to the White House to receive that. And then we were again asked back a few years later to play at the last state dinner uh, um, for President Obama and the Prime Minister of Singapore. And the students were playing as guests were entering. So this national exposure, along with um, exposure from our Bean Consortium through the Mellon Foundation is a huge boost to our visibility. And it puts us in a position to not only show our media community, but our peers across the nation, the importance of our work and its uh, value on equity and inclusion in the arts. Um, and all of that ties in with fundraising. And I feel like fundraising along with programming is really, really pushes projects up for it. So it was this exposure in around that time, around 2014, 2016, um, that gained us a wonderful friend in our immediate backyard uh, through the Willow Tree Fund. And I've been working with the Willow Tree Fund to do um, a match for last fiscal year, this fiscal year, and the next fiscal year. Um, if we raise $15,000 from new donors, they will then provide us with $15,000. Um, so this is kind of really important during a pandemic um, because matching programs are always very attractive to our, our friends and constituents. So we get that word of mouth again where we're, our, our donors are able to share this with their friends and it really makes a huge difference in our bottom line. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I, I guess I would just say that I truly love this program and I'm honored to be part of it. And I want to say thank you again for having us. And I will pass this on to my colleague, Alyssa. Hi, thank you so much, um, Jody. Really appreciate you passing it to me, but also thank you to University of Massachusetts Amherst and Elizabeth Chang for inviting Project Step to be a part of this conversation. Really appreciate it. So again, my name is Alyssa Lee and I am so proud to serve as the executive director of Project Step. 
if you can't tell, I love my job um, to have this opportunity to work with this incredible team that you've seen today and a few members that weren't able to join us along with all of our um, huge support network that, that has been mentioned thus far um, is just uh, an opportunity that I am truly um, thankful for. So backtracking a little bit into how did I get here? Um, like many of you, you know, music was my passion when I was growing up. And really for me, it was my pathway to get into college. Um, I received my undergraduate degree in applied oboe, so not a string player, um, from Western Michigan University with dreams of one day playing with the BSO. Um, but honestly, come my senior year, I didn't want to be on stage anymore. And I wanted to focus on the community and get people excited about classical music. But at that time, I didn't know what that meant or how I was going to do it. So I took a little bit of time off and served in both the AmeriCorps and Peace Corps. And these were really just life changing roles for me. It was my first real experience connecting with my community, using what I know best, using music as a vehicle for social change. And that's what led to my career as an arts administrator. Um, after volunteering, I also received my graduate degree similar to Jody from Boston University um, in arts administration. And for those last 15 years, I've worked specifically, um, you know, being really mindful about finding organizations that are really mission driven, that are small arts nonprofit organizations have had a number of different roles. And Again, as I started with Project Step, um, it feels recently in some ways, in some ways not at all, but I started in January of, of 2019 as their executive director. So in my role as executive director of Project Step, I get to make sure that the Project Step team has everything that they need to make sure that we are serving our students at the highest level possible. I work closely with our board of directors, which has currently 17 members, the administrative team of six, which includes me, our founding program partners, which includes the New England Conservatory, the Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston University, and of course, our families. This year we have 58 students. Our families play a critical role in the organization and as an acknowledgement of this incredible support system that they are for our students. Um, all of our families are part of a parent's council. This is similar to the traditional school parent council. And our parent council at Project Step has two parent representatives that sit as voting members on our board of directors, which of course I report to. So bringing it full circle, I'm actively seeking to um, align and engage all members of our community to ensure that Project Step continues to fulfill its mission in a sustainable way. So this is everything from HR policy development to financial management to back when we were in person, helping students and parents set up a room for a concert. For me personally, having my hand in these many different buckets to best support Project Step Team is something I really love doing on a daily basis. There's always something new to do. But in the big picture, what excites me about Project Step is that I was lucky enough to find an organization that resonates with my own personal core values. I firmly believe that the arts are fundamental to our collective understanding of who we are as individuals, what we believe and how we relate to each other and our surroundings. The opportunity to work with Project Step as an organization that has a clear mission to address the racial imbalance of the classical music profession is immensely important and significant. As a collaborative organization, we are all making an impact on a child's life. The students and project staff are continuously building key social, emotional, academic, and artistic skills that will lead to opportunities and achievement both on and off the stage as they are agents of social change and leaders in their communities today. So we've certainly done our fair share of talking. Again, thank you all so much for your time. And if you have any questions for us, I know we, we are welcome and, and eager to hear. People should, should feel free to just unmute and ask.
while you guys come up with a question, um, I would love to hear if anybody wants to maybe break the ice by saying, um, sharing if you were familiar with Project Step before tonight, um, that might be a, 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 a starting point. Or if you have a question in the meantime, feel free. I have a question. Um, are, are you guys generally retaining your class of incoming students? So how much of a attrition is there? That, that's a really good question. Um, so attrition in a program like Project Step, where most of, you know, I mentioned the long term, it, it's something that we take very uh, seriously. You know, retain our goal is obviously to retain all the students who identify that this program is right for them. And when I say that is for all of the artists in the room um, or virtually, um, we know that our paths as artists is not a straight line. And to be in a rigorous program like this, especially from a young age, um, you know, interests change. Uh, uh, there's, you know, family uh, needs change. Um, so there are times when a student or family decides that, you know, th this program is not right for them. It, it's not right for everyone. It's a very specific program. It's, it's meant, uh, it's geared to students that really are, are serious or, or want to pursue this as far as they can. And Project Step will remove any barrier that's on their way. Um, so in terms of attrition, we start in kindergarten with the focus program, there's two selection uh, levels where we start with usually somewhere between 60 to 80 students in our kindergarten focus program, which is a eurythmics based, which is music and movement, learning the fundamentals of music through movement. Um, it's a, uh, the teaching method is what we use to introduce in, in small groups. Obviously this is pre-pandemic. Right now we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do during the pandemic. But um, we start with 60 to 80 kindergartners in small groups. And from that, we select a, about 25 students from teacher recommendation to go to Focus 2, which is where they're introduced to Suzuki Valley or Cello over the summer. And from those 25 students that are introduced to the Suzuki Valley and Cello, we usually select about, depending on the year, depending on how we're doing financially, being a nonprofit, depending on, 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 on the roster of the, of the program, we take somewhere between four to five uh, kindergartners to come in as first graders. And that is considered big, um, a big class. And some of you guys that work with other programs might be like, wait, that's not big at all. But you have to realize what Jody said earlier, that those four or five students that we're accepting as first graders, we're committing to supporting the comprehensive music education for them for 12 years. So we're committing uh, to, to that longevity. Um, it's not just four or five students for one year, it's for, for 12. So we start with four or five and that's roughly how many students there are per class. Uh, there's some grades that it might have a few more, one or two more than that because we also have auditions once a year. So if students that didn't come in through our feeder program, they can audition in. So we have on average between four to six students per grade level up until middle school. And that's where you start seeing some attrition. Um, by the time we get to high school, we usually have anywhere between two to four students. And the attrition that happens in those middle years, uh, some most frequently is, is a change of interest. Obviously middle school is where, you know, if they become serious about sports or academics or something else, mind you, for those of you guys who have done music seriously, you don't have to, there are so many students that don't have to pick one. They can still do high level academics and, and sports and still do high level music, but it's also, a, it's a tough call. So around the middle school is when we start changing, seeing the numbers, um, you know, maybe one or two students a year, either through self selection might withdraw. We also have evaluations that the students have to play every year. So there's conversations that happen there. If a student's not meeting the expectations, we don't just, kick them out, we are committed to their development. So sometimes they need extra support to get back on track. Sometimes, you know, they need a, a semester of just extra help and um, to the side, wait, no, I'm, this is not what I'm serious about. Um, so, so by the time we get to high school, we usually have two to four students uh, per grade level. Um, but percentage wise, beginning to end, 
in the 10 years that I was there. So this is from 2007 to 2017. These are the figures that I know off the top of my head. Since August, I don't know what the uh, latest numbers are, but it was around an 85% retention rate for students from once they enter, most of them through kindergarten, all the way to 12th grade. And this would also include the students that audition in. So that was kind of a, sorry, a little bit of a long um, answer, but it, it's something that we take seriously, bottom line. Um, just, uh, there's a question that came in um, directly. Uh, the students who played on the video are well taught and seem quite serious. Do you have any kind of practice buddy system to help keep the kids on track? That's a great question. Um, we, and actually Rachel, this might be a, a, a good place to, um, we have an amazing mentoring program that I'm gonna let Rachel tell you about, but also practice buddies is something that we identify when a student is struggling and they really need intense uh, practice help. That's something that we frequently are able to provide, but we also have this amazing mentoring program as well. Yeah, I'm sorry, Javier, could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, so the, the students seem well taught and, and seem quite serious. Do we have any kind of practice buddy system to help keep the kids on track? And I was just mentioning that when somebody's really struggling, we, we really do provide extra uh, a, a specific help in practicing, but the mentoring program, I think also helps with this, um, with the practice support. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have um, that system of assigning practice buddies if needed. Um, as I mentioned, the mentorship program, our mentors are in um, sixth through 12th grade, and then our mentees are all the way down to first up until fifth grade. So, um, you know, ideally we'd love to have all students in this program for the students that are currently enrolled in the mentorship program. Um, you know, music is playing a role in their relationship. It's what they have in common and it's a good starting point. So many of our older students are helping out the younger students practice each week, whether that means, you know, just running through something with them, spending dedicated time, making sure that they practice because their parents are home and working or if that means helping them write out a practice schedule. Um, I think the program you know, has been effective so far because, because of the retention rate, students who have found success and are at the high school age know what it takes and what dedication is needed to successfully move throughout the program. So, you know, I haven't been through Project STEP, but our, our high schoolers have and they know what it takes. So they're able to guide our younger students through that journey. And one, one more thing about that is, I, I wasn't sure if the person who asked the question, if you were interested in terms of a potential uh, volunteer opportunity, feel free to reach out to us by email. That's something that, um, you know, we usually handle practice buddies internally, but there are opportunities occasionally where, you know, if somebody wanted to hop out in that way, um, we, we can discuss. Um, so if, if, if that's where the interest was coming from, feel free to reach out. I did have a question come in from Rebecca privately, um, just so everyone knows. It's, she's asking more about the mindfulness program um, that I'm implementing. So the, the mindfulness workshop so far will be, a, you know, a one or two time occurrence. Um, you know, part of my work is asking our students directly what they need more of and what they want that they're not getting within that musical diet, as Javier, Javier called it. Um, so, you know, mental health and um, self-care and those types of things are, you know, certainly important, especially in music, um, but we're not always able to address those in our hour-long lesson with our private teacher. So um, this mindfulness workshop is going to be with a local psychologist who is also a musician, so she can, she can relate in that way. Um, and she's going to take our students through um, an interactive workshop hit them with some psychology tips and you know, give them some methods of um, practicing mindfulness, not only when they're playing music and trying to practice effectively during this time where there are so many distractions online, um, but also in their, their daily lives. So that's a little bit about that program and you know, hopefully we will continue to offer similar programs in the future.
How do you work with families to uh, help them learn how to support their, their children in this program? That's another great question. And um, I gotta say for any of those that are, are teaching um, or have worked in, in programs um, like similar to Project Step, family involvement is key, a key factor to success. Um, and uh, as Alyssa mentioned, you know, we have a parent council so that we provide a forum where, you know, parent concerns, if they need help, hey, you know, um, most of our parents are not musicians. We have the occasional, you know, students that their parents are musicians, so they can, they can help from that standpoint. But this program is designed that's not necessary and it's not a, how should I say, puts students at a disadvantage if they don't have a family member who's musical because uh, one of the things that we do, me as the artistic director, I do touch base and connect regularly with parents. And, for, you know, when you're talking about grade from grades one through 12, the support that parents need with elementary students in grades, you know, one through five versus middle school versus high school was completely different. Um, so in terms of parental support, um, you know, and not only from when I say myself, you know, obviously all the other staff is a resource, faculty is a resource, and parents themselves are resource. The way students are mentors, you know, the, the older students are mentors to the younger students. A lot of the parents that have been with the program um, pre-pandemic, you know, for the 36 and a half years that Project Step was around before the pandemic came, you know, physically, we, you know, our families meet every Saturday at Symphony Hall. So that interaction proves really, really useful because they develop a community, that community of support that I mentioned is, is multifaceted. They help each other. The students help students, parents help parents, the staff, because we're such a small program, I'm very accessible and I connect with parents in terms of, you know, the first two years, we it's required that parents sit in, in the private lessons. So the ones that don't know anything about music, it's very helpful for them to have, you know, to develop some confidence that they can support their child. They don't need to be musicians, but they kind of learn some of the basics. In middle school, it's always a struggle. Some of the parents want to continue attending the classes and their child does not want them to continue. So some of the support usually has to do with, hey, you know, parent, maybe this is a, a good time to just let the teacher do the pushing and, and it shouldn't come from the parent because sometimes it backfires, you know, obviously every student is different, but that's something that we see frequently. So again, the multifaceted community of support, it's, it's, it's key to helping parents, parents, helping parents, staff, helping parents. Um, that's something that we are very active and we focus on. Thank you. Any other questions? If we have time, I, I might, again, throw another prompt out. It, it may or may not work, but this is, I think, the third um, presentation in your series. Uh, are there any um, interesting uh, similarities or differences? Um, you know, every single program is absolutely different. Um, but I, I would love to hear any observations. A lot of uh, a lot of the people who are here tonight actually have been at the previous presentation, so you guys should feel free to speak up. Um, but I, I, this is certainly different in that this is the first um, presentation we've seen about something that's this long term and takes this kind of investment in, you know, in a very small small cohort of, of students. And it's you know it's, it's a, I mean it's astonishing how successful it is really. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I know there are a couple of students in the audience who have had a little bit of experience with this kind of work and I'd love to hear them speak up. Um, I think it's interesting how it sounds like with this program and the previous two programs really emphasize 
um, encouraging students to support each other and also um, the programs seem to all support the students as whole people, not just as musicians. I just um, wanna... Oh, sorry, oh. Javier. I did have a question go, go ahead. Ahead, um, from my friend, Anthony. He says, um, is Project Step something that wants to spread Meaning if someone wanted to start a project step chapter in another city, is that possible? I will leave this. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to give my, uh, from what I know from my 10 years, and Alyssa, feel free to add, jump in to add. Um, so in the 10 years that I was there, um, in my previous, in my first iteration, um, the answer is yes. Of, of, of course, people um, have, have, have asked project step frequently whether we want to expand or whether they can, you know, learn from us to kind of bring some of this learning to start a, a similar program. And um, just so you guys know, back in the day in um, the Atlanta Symphony has the Talent Development Program, TDP, which is very similar to Project Step. Um, it's very intense, intensive uh, instruction, high level um, for students of color. And um, they, when they were starting that program, they reached out to, to Project Step and they met with uh, our directors at that time. And obviously it's, it's independent, it's Project Step, we're independent, we're not affiliated with anybody, but they consulted us, they kind of asked uh, all, uh, the founding directors questions and were able to kind of model some of the things, some similarities. There's of course some differences with TDP in, in Atlanta. It is a program of the Atlanta Symphony. It's run by the Atlanta Symphony. Project Step is an independent nonprofit. We have a partnership. Um, we're very lucky that we have a partnership with the Boston Symphony since day one. Our founder, um, Bill Moyer, he was the personal manager of the Boston Symphony in 1982, and it was his idea to start this program. Um, so because of that, we are very lucky to have this very close relationship and we're in residence at Symphony Hall, but we're not a Symphony Hall program, we're an independent nonprofit. Um, also Dallas Strings is a very um, similar program. Um, so the, the, also I wanna uh, give a shout out to an alum, Kurt Johnson started Sounds Academy in Arizona. So that's one of probably the, the most closely related in terms of an alum wanting to start a similar program. And, and, and making it happen. And he consulted with us. Um, I was there when he was starting Sounds Academy. So those are kind of some of the programs. We, another question that we get quite frequently, are, are we an L-Sistema program? We're not, we actually, interesting fact, we got started around the same time. L-Sistema started in, in Venezuela, um, Party Step started in Boston. We're not an L-Sistema program, a lot of similarities, but we're not. Um, so there's another question coming in. Yes, Ron Bing, there's, uh, do you want to ask your question? Sure. First of all, um, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. First of all, I want to thank you all for wonderful introductions and uh, a great overview of your program. I think this is really fantastic. And I wonder, since a lot of you have studied arts management before, for someone who are interested in the positions and what are some of the skills um, he or she should master or have an understanding of before stepping to that positions or anything that you would you think that would be helpful for a student who are interested in this path. Thank you. I will take that on, but certainly um, any any of my colleagues feel free to jump in. I, I think the one of the key elements is is just being being flexible, um, to, to have that demonstrated experience of your willingness to, to jump in and do, or to, to be driven by, by the mission. So if that's attending a fundraising event, awesome. If that means that you're calling parents to make sure that they are, are going to show up for class, you know, that, that you have those people skills. Um, so I, I think some sort of hard skills that, that you could take though is is uh, yeah people skills logistics and operations um i i think are two key factors because so many organizations like ours are, are small that you've 
got to be on top of it in regards to, to deadlines, timelines, and, and organizing your, your planning. <laughs> I might just add that um, I think it's really important to go into an organization that you wholeheartedly would support on your own. I mean, ultimately, working in a nonprofit, you it's you're wearing a lot of hats, as as Alyssa mentioned, and you have to keep really organized. And you might think you're going into one role, but really, you end up doing a lot more than what's asked of you. And you should feel good about that. So it's really, um, for me, you know, working with Project Step, I just, you know, found a role that I absolutely love because I I love the, the families and, and the, the program and, and what it stands for. And I think that's really important. So looking for something that you know um, will be important to you. Thank you. Have you guys ever experimented? Oh, Rose, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for talking to us. I was wondering if, um, do a lot of your students end up pursuing music professionally or some or? Like, how does that work? So I, um, I think Jody mentioned the latest is about 60% of our alum are actively in the music profession, whether they're uh, prof in a professional orchestra, teaching or in some sort of, for example, uh, Kirk Johnson at Sounds Academy created his own music program. Um, so that 60%, I mean, as we all know, those are, the, the, the music field is, is, is very tough and challenging and it's something that you, you need to be clear that you have a passion for it because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. But I wouldn't have it any, any other way. I, it, it, it really is genuine. Um, and it, it, this, uh, I think it was Jody that mentioned, even the students that don't go into uh, professional classical music, um, even though that's our mission, um, they all across the board feel that their lives are transformed through this high level education. All of these skills that we, they learn and they refine through Project Step is what helps them go into med school or engineering. Um, or whatever, um, every single one of them have attributed their success, whether it was in music or not, through the what they learned at, at Project Step. Um, but that being said, I mean, we do, you know, Tony Reimer, he's a cellist. If you guys, if any string players out there, Google him. He's one, He's an amazing world-class soloist living in Germany. Valley Phillips um, is playing, um, I think, in the C Seattle Symphony. Um, so we, um, Colin Ben, um, I think, did you guys hear from Music Haven before us? He was part of Music Haven. I don't think he still is, but um, so there are alums out there. Kirk Johnson started his own program. Um, little by little, you know, making a difference in the field. Um, but yeah, about 60% are uh, have pursued music after part of step. Uh, we have a question from Laughlin Miller. Yes, hi. You said that um, you do Eurythmics classes with uh, kindergartners to kind of scout out who might be good, uh, good fit for the program. I was wondering, um, do the kinder kindergartners go into those because of uh, uh, parent decisions or the school teacher's recommendations? Or um, do you just pick whole classes um, from schools to go into those? Um, um the short answer is all of the above. Um, we aggressively uh, try to reach out to all the Boston public schools. Um, that's where, you know, we're based in Boston. Um, and that's where we want to focus our recruitment. It's not a requirement that they're living in Boston. It's we serve students from the whole greater Boston metropolitan area as long as they can get to us. It's open to them. But the, the way we get the word out for students to enter focus one, um, that it's an open call. The only requirement is that they're from an underrepresented community um, in music, again, primarily Black and Latino. Um, so uh, that's the only requirement. We get the word out in the public schools. We have partnerships with some of the public schools that are hosting us for these classes. So there is a, a benefit that, you know, the students in those schools do get, 
you know, um, they're well aware of this program, but we also have an open call that, you know, we have classes that take place at NEC, um, at New England Conservatory, so that students that are not at these schools where we have the sections, they can still sign up. Did, by the way, did that answer your question, Lachlan? Yeah, I, yes. Okay. And I just want to add, um, the selection process from focus one to focus two is by teacher recommendation. So once the 60 to 80 students that were welcomed in and are introduced to the fundamentals of music by teacher recommendation, that's how we go from 60 to 80 down to 25. And then same thing from 25 to five, four or five by teacher recommendation based on their participation in class. So obviously this is a path that you guys have chosen as an organization to really focus on this small cohort. Have you ever considered or experimented with scaling it up a little bit? Um, the answer is, of course we want to. The, the, the formula, it's so tricky because being a nonprofit, you know, and again, what I, we're small but mighty and, but we're the depth of, of the instruction that we offer for 12 years for each of these students receiving all of this. Um, that's the, that's the, the, the challenge and that's why the, the size we are. Um, when the program started, it was much smaller and there's been different periods of growth. You know, 2007, there was this growth and if, if for those who, of, of you who remember, that was a tough financial year, we had to cut the program in half because giving, because of the, you know, the, the, the financial crisis that happened back then, uh, we had to cut the program in half. Fortunately, ever since then, there was a lot of learning that we've been able to grow little by little. So now we're back at 58, you know, the program started with 12 or 20, it grew to like, you know, 40s, 45, um, 50 students around 2007, that we cut it back to 25, and now we're back at 58. We do want growth. But one thing that we learned after 2007, it has to be careful, sustainable growth. So yes, but little by little. Okay, well, any more questions of last call here? So I don't want to keep everyone all night, but um, this has been s s terrific. Thank you guys so much. Um, and, you know, we look forward to paying attention to how, um, how your program continues to thrive and hoping that we can get that live visit in at some point, not too distant future, which is what we originally had planned on. So, oh, is that you, Jamie Rose? Did you have a question? I was just going to say thank you to the panel for um, we as faculty so many times find ourselves in a position with our students um, trying to guide in a way to uh, help them find their career paths um, as part of our holistic sort of experience that uh, UMass encouraging entrepreneurial um, uh, hopes and in, in their career paths. And I really appreciated hearing how you sort of came into your careers not necessarily majoring in arts administration or taking or business course or you were performers and teachers and um, educators and found your way uh, into your career path. So I, that, that's really helpful for our students and for me as a faculty member to hear that to then to be able to re relay that to my students who are on that search in their early 20s for what they want to do for their lives, you know. So thank you. Yeah, I would agree. So... All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we will, this will be posted on a live stream so you can tell your friends who 